Okay. I'd like to welcome you all to this seminar, Residential Food Waste Regulatory Strategies, uh, where NERC is partnering with NUMOA, the Northeast Waste Management Officials Association, to bring you the seminar. My name is Mary Ann Raymolador. I'm the Assistant Director of NERC, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. Uh, we would like to thank our sponsors. Uh, we have uh, Shore Clothes and Vanguard Renewables. Thank you for your support. And today we're going to take an in-depth look at the regulatory, regulatory strategies chosen by California, our third largest state, and Vermont, one of our smallest states, for residential food waste diversion. We have three great speakers, and I'd like to um, read to you a little bit about them. Mallory Burden is a senior environmental scientist for CalRecycle, where she leads projects to provide local assistance to state agencies, schools, and local jurisdictions implementing waste diversion programs. We have Emma Stuhl, who is an environment analyst for the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation, where she wears many hats to implement Vermont's materials management plan and laws. We also have Dr. Emily Bellarmino, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Nutrition and Food Sciences and the Food Systems Program at the University of Vermont. Her work explores the links between diets, the environment, and human health. We're going to be taking questions throughout the, the uh, seminar, but the questions won't be addressed until the final 30 minutes. But we do ask you to post them in the chat. And I'm going to stop sharing. And Mallory, I ask that you share your screen. Thank you. How's that? That's good. All right, well, thank you to Northeast Recycling Council for organizing this seminar of thought leaders in the solid waste and recycling industries. Cal Recycle is grateful to be included and talk with you today about our food rescue and organics recycling law to cut landfill methane emissions. So many of you spearhead efforts in your own areas to reduce methane emissions, increase diversion, and innovate your way to a zero waste circular economy. So thank you all for your work. SB 1383 is yet another law to further the diversion and recycling of materials that has brought innovators together to talk trash, yourselves included. Senate Bill 1383 passed in 2016 as part of California's larger strategy to fight climate change. This law was designed to reduce the global warming super pollutants like methane, which um, is up to 84 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So to reduce methane now, we have to move away from landfilling our organic waste like food, paper, and yard waste. And because methane breaks down in the atmosphere much faster than carbon dioxide, cutting this pollution will impact our climate much faster. And when organic materials break down in the landfill, it gives off methane. And in California, landfills are the third largest polluter for methane into our environment. Recycling organic waste and recovering unsold food is a fast track to fighting climate change. We are already experiencing the devastating impacts of climate change, but moving to a circular economy and not disposing of organic waste is a fast track to fighting climate change. SB 1383 is a statewide target that requires California to reduce organic waste disposal by 75% and increase edible food recovery by 20% by 2025. Organic waste is defined broadly in the regulation and includes anything organic that is disposed in the landfills that emits methane. So this includes food waste, paper, green waste, organic textiles and carpets, lumber, 
wood, biosolids, digestate, manure, and sludges. On January 1st of 2022, the jurisdiction requirements went into effect and CalRecycle began enforcement. And soon, on January 1st of 2024, jurisdictions will be required to take enforcement against non-compliant entities. SB 1383 is a statewide target and not a jurisdiction organic waste diversion target. So due to this structure, the regulations establish state minimum standards and jurisdictions and the regulated community have to demonstrate compliance with each of the standards. This slide shows the main requirements that jurisdictions have. They must collect organic waste, procure recycled organic materials, plan local capacity for programs, keep records, enforce local requirements, and establish a local food recovery program. So I wanna walk you through what implementation looks like for some of the SB 1383 requirements that I think will be of interest to attendees on this seminar. The regulations standardize container colors and minimum levels of acceptable materials for collection containers provided across the entire state. So the collection containers uniformity was established because um, we got a lot of stakeholder feedback on this. And these requirements were established in order to enhance the organic waste generators education about organic waste recycling, but also to help reduce contamination and generator confusion about the appropriate container in which to place each type of material and to ensure that generators maintain the highest degree of recoverability for source separated organic wastes. So the color scheme is either the lid has to be the appropriate color or the body is the appropriate color and the lid is um, the specified color or it, the lid could be gray or black. A jurisdiction is not required to replace functional containers that do not comply with the color requirements of this article prior to the end of the useful life of these containers or prior to January 1, 2036, whichever comes first. And as I stated before, one of the requirements in the regulations is for the procurement of record, recovered organic waste products and for recycled content paper and paper products. So recovered organic waste products, which are shown here and include mulch, compost, energy products from in-vessel digestion, including transportation fuel, electricity, or gas used for heating appliances, and electricity from biomass conversion. The regulations outline the specific details as to what makes these products eligible for procurement, but the key is that the products must be one, made from California landfill diverted organic waste, and two, be made at specific types of facilities or operations. And jurisdictions are required to procure these types of products. And for the procurement of record recovered organic waste products, jurisdictions are defined as cities, counties, or cities and counties. So how much of these products should each jurisdiction procure? Well, CalRecycle assigned an annual procurement target to each jurisdiction based on their population. And jurisdictions can meet their procurement target through either a direct procurement, um, where the jurisdictions are directly using the product themselves or giving it away, or they can have a direct service provider. Um, for example, a jurisdiction could have a written contract or agreement with an entity like a hauler or a contractor to procure the eligible products on, be on behalf of that jurisdiction. The procurement of these products helps close the loop to ensure that the increased amount of organics materials diverted are put back into our systems in beneficial ways. Our cycle is working with cities, counties, and special districts that provide solid waste collection services in order to ensure that we reach California's critical organic waste climate goals together. 
Since the climate law's passage in 2016, Cal Recycle has worked alongside cities and counties to help shape regulations and allow program flexibility and offer various pathways to compliance. So we have local assistance staff assigned to every jurisdiction to help individual jurisdictions with the implementation tools, as well as present to their elected officials. CalRecycle continues to provide tools and resources to help jurisdictions succeed. That include webinars, trainings, education and out outreach materials in various languages, uh, providing presentations to elected officials and model tools to support capacity planning, facility measurement, edible food programs, and procurement. CalRecycle grants, loans, and other state funding assistance are available to support local investments to reduce climate emissions and create jobs in our communities. As our jurisdictions continue to take the next steps in SB 1383, CalRecycle is also taking the next steps of implementation. So CalRecycle holds monthly SB 1383 chats to answer questions regarding implementation. And more importantly, to bring together peers to share their successes, to help spark ideas to further improve these programs. So we have an SB 1383 chat later today on schools and how they're implementing their edible food recovery program. And we have another one um, on the 18th and that will be for enforcement. So I'll put information in the chat about these events coming up. I also wanted to share that we have the iRecycle Smart marketing campaign that launched, which consists of interactive tips for consumers on how to reduce waste. We have educational videos for consumers on doing their part in the recycling process, resources for consumers to identify what can be recycled in their area, including harder to dispose of items such as mattresses, carpet, batteries, and paint. And then there are also campaign materials for jurisdictions to use, including videos, audio, social media assets, digital display ads, out of home advertisements, print materials, and tools for schools. So each local program will look a little bit different. So you can check irecyclesmart.com for specifics that complement different types of local recycling programs. So as I mentioned, there are various pathways for local compliance with SB 1383 requirements that took effect on January 1 of 2022. Regulations allow for various curbside collection options, including adding food waste to existing yard waste bins for processing. And additional requirements related to container color and labeling are phased in to help jurisd jurisdiction maximize their resources and ensure that we're keeping everything flexible. Program flexibility in SB 1383 regulations include a waiver and exemption process for rural, low population, and high elevation jurisdictions. In addition, in 2021, lawmakers passed SB 619, giving local jurisdictions the chance to submit to the department a notification of intent to comply by no later than March 1st of 2022. And this gave them additional time without facing penalties for SB 1383 in 2022, as long as their corrective action plan was accepted by CalRecycle and the jurisdiction implements the compliance actions proposed in that plan. So we had 127 notifications that were submitted and CalRecycle is working with jurisdictions to draft the correction action plans and to monitor them. Mm -hmm. CalRecycle is responsible for oversight to ensure that we achieve our statewide targets. So CalRecycle continues to provide guidance, early identification and communication of issues and other compliance assistance to help jurisdictions meet their um, responsibilities with compliance. 
So for entities such as public universities, school districts, federal facilities, they are exempt from local solid waste oversight. So Cow Recycle will be directly responsible for ensuring compliance. However, the jurisdictions are still required to provide education and outreach to these entities. Under SB 1383 regulations, Cal Recycle has a progressive enforcement process and penalties are imposed as a last resort after all other compliance actions have failed. Jurisdiction compliance. Um, with the initial implementation that we have, Cal Recycle is focusing on compliance assistance and will pursue enforcement for egregious offenders. <clears throat> We're beginning on the next journey in waste management. And so I want to update you on the status of our implementation. We have about 616 cities, counties, and special districts with waste management services who have um, compliance requirements under these SB 1383 regulations. And of those 139 jurisdictions have received um, approval for rural, low population or high elevation waivers and exemptions with some of the requirements of SB 1383. Of course, each jurisdiction has a unique system and co full compliance with SB 1383 will depend on which organics recycling system they choose to fit their needs. 460 jurisdictions have self-reported to us that they have residential food waste collection. And nearly all the jurisdictions reported that they have newer expanding food recovery programs and expanding commercial food collection and recycling programs. We have 455 jurisdictions that were awarded $50.6 million in local assistance funding from Cal Recycle to help pay for the organics recycling tools like new curbside containers, education outreach materials, technology and equipment. And eligibility for this funding included adopting an enforceable organics collection ordinance. And we are currently in the next round for this local assistance funding opportunity that's available for the jurisdictions. CalRecycle will conduct evaluations of compliance and progress toward meeting the SB 1383 targets at least once every four years for every single jurisdiction. Um, so we have 25 compliance evaluations that are currently being conducted now. <clears throat> and we are measuring the statewide ach achievements through many different avenues. Um, we require the jurisdictions to report comprehensive program information to us in an electronic database once per year. We also have our local assistance staff conduct conference calls and site visits with them once per year to verify information and to ask clarifying questions. We also have our jurisdiction compliance staff monitoring the jurisdictions on the 619 corrective action plans every other month. And the same jurisdiction compliance staff are also conducting those compliance evaluations on each jurisdiction once in a four year period. Furthermore, we conduct periodic statewide waste characterization studies to better understand the types and amounts of materials that are still being disposed of from the waste stream so that we can alter our approach as needed. And this is our chance to create an endless loop of value through collection and recycling innovating circular systems for continual collection, recycling, and re reuse will help turn trash into California's next boom industry. So in closing, I want to reiterate the importance of our work together and the impact that it will have for the humans we love and our environment. This is just a disclaimer slide noting that this presentation is a guidance tool developed as a courtesy for information and example purposes only. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mallory. Um, if you could stop sharing. Yeah. And then Emma, if you could share your screen.
Emma, you're still muted. There you go. All right. Can you see it? I now I can. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Well, very interesting to go after California. It's um, both humbling and inspiring to think about the work that it takes to make this happen in such a larger state. So um, in Vermont, the residential food waste ban is part of the universal recycling law. I'm going to give a brief overview of this law and talk mostly about the work that's been done to implement it. And then we'll spend a little bit of time looking at some of the impacts to date. So the universal recycling law passed unanimously in 2012 in the Vermont legislature. I made this small on purpose. so You hopefully won't get sucked in reading it because it includes a lot of other themes other than residential food scrap management. So let's just focus on the five parts that touch on residential food scraps. So in 2015, the law required anyone who was um, collecting or accepting trash for a fee to charge by the weight or the volume of trash. So if you have more bags of trash, you have to pay more. Or if you have a bigger bag or a smaller bag or a bigger tote um, or two versus two totes, you're going to pay more. So that was to create an incentive for folks to um, a financial incentive for folks to produce less trash and maybe be motivated to get their food scraps and recycling and other out of the trash. And that's called pay as you throw. And then from 2014 to 2020, the law required the, the largest and then smaller and smaller businesses and institutions to keep their food scraps out of the trash if they're near a compost facility that had the capacity to handle their food scraps. So the first phase in was for like the universities and the hospitals, and then it rolled down over time to smaller um, entities like the large restaurants and then the medium restaurants. And then in 2020, the law banned food scraps from the trash for everyone in the state. So that is the residential food scrap ban. And it also meant that small businesses um, and institutions that hadn't had the law apply before now also needed to keep their food scraps out of the trash. In 2017, the law required transfer stations to start offering food scrap collection. There is no rule about what they can charge for them. So the fees vary really widely across the state from it being a free or very cheap service that's subsidized by trash fees or some other mechanism that's cheap and, or free and motivates people to use it to some places where it's relatively expensive and not that many people use that service. And then in 2020, the law did require um, trash haulers to offer food scrap collection to their non-residential customers and to their customers who were apartment complexes with four or more residential units, unless there was another hauler who was willing to offer that service. So that piece of the law was meant to really fill in a gap if there were places where there was not a food scrap collection service available to require haulers to, to be offering that service. So those are the pieces that relate to this residential food scrap ban. Um, and our implementation has had two big focuses. And I guess I should just say, like, I found I just cannot fit everything into this presentation, everything we've done. So this is just a sampling of the work that's been done. It's probably true for every presentation ever. But implementation has fit into two big buckets. One is thinking about behavior and trying to um, actually get each person in Vermont to take their food scraps and manage them separately from the trash and then to um, have them be managed properly and in a way that does not become a nuisance, whether it's feeding animals or composting. Um, and so this behavior focus, this behavior part, um, our work and other people's work has really focused on just information, getting the word out, and also on influencing and social norming, and also on coaching and really trying to help people navigate this change if it was a change for them as easily as possible and to try and um, reduce barriers to doing this behavior. And then the other big focus has been on systems and infrastructure and making sure that Vermont has the capacity to compost um, or manage in another way, but a lot of it is through composting, has the capacity in that infrastructure, um, sorry, has the capacity to actually manage all these food scraps both in terms of the infrastructure to manage them and then also the knowledge. So let's uh, zoom in on these themes. So one tactic for this behavior piece was, is that we've done a bunch of media campaigns. Um, our department has done three paid campaigns across media, print, 
radio, TV, online. Um, we've also tried to earn media, doing media pitches, and have been really responsive to um, reporters that have reached out to us or radio show hosts, just trying to get our messages out to as many people as possible in as many ways as possible. And we also maintain a social media account that we sometimes put money into and sometimes do not. That um, was really uh, impactful and helpful during this, uh, the rollout of the residential food scrap change in 2020 when food scraps became banned from the trash for everyone. So in 2020, we launched the Let's Scrap Food Waste campaign. This is the paid campaign and it focused on the basic information <laughs> that food scraps were now banned from the trash for everyone and we needed to separate them out of the trash and manage them in another way. And it also focused on the why, the reasons behind why this law went into effect and why it's worth our time. And it tried to really tie into values that people already have, like caring for the planet for their children's future or to um, support healthy soil that can grow healthy food. And then the um, campaign linked folks back to a campaign specific website that was really pared down, had very simple information, not overwhelming. Here's what you need to do. Here's how you do it. Here's some tips. And then it also had a scrapbook, which is a collection of testimonials from businesses and also from residents that um, is just people telling their story with words and pictures of how they manage their food scraps in a bunch of different ways and how they make it easy for themselves and what works for them and what they think about it. And they generally have like a fun, you can do it. It's not that hard <laughs> tone, I'll say. Um, and then the website also would steer people to vtrecycles.com, which is our main um, website. We have a food scraps page that is the like holder of all the information. <laughs> if you want to go deep, you can go to vtrecycles. Dot com And it also directed folks to our social media accounts, which was a great way for people to get more information and also to ask questions. Um, and we just have a lot of different resources available on our website. We maintain a list of um, Vermont's food scrap haulers. So if folks are looking for a hauler, or want to get some quotes, they can go there. We have a great backyard composting guide, inspiring poster and so much more. And many of these resources we also use in print out in the world and our partners do too. Um, and then on the right are just two examples of social media posts that um, did really well during the summer that food scraps were becoming banned from the trash because social media and also VT Recycles were great ways for us to respond to common questions in real time we would get a question coming in and realize there was a need for information and we could post about it right away or update that VT Recycles website right away. And we had a bunch of posts of this type go Vermont viral. So <laughs> Vermont is really small, so it's not the same as California viral, but um, we were able to really meet a need for information and um, get messages out that other people who are interested could help spread to really yeah, just get everyone the info they needed to be successful and get their questions answered. Um, we also have bin signs and stickers and FAQs and so much more available on our website. We just have really tried to be responsive to needs that were communicated to us um, for outreach materials and um, other tools. And I'll just mention that some of these resources were made by partner organizations and they graciously shared them with us and allowed us to make a statewide version. So if any of you out there are doing similar work and you would like to use any of our resources, feel free to be in touch and we can, we're happy to share and we can send you a version that doesn't have our branding and is more appropriate to share or connect you with the original author of the material. So this was just a great way to just lift up, you know, with less effort, lift up the general quality of materials available in the state. So there's still more work to be done on this front for sure, but um, it's good to just keep moving forward. Let's see, in 2021, the Let's Scrap Food Waste campaign, media campaign continued, but it had a focus on this is the law and also here are some tips to waste less food in the first place to have fewer food scraps to manage. And it directed folks back again to that Let's Scrap Food Waste website. And then in 2022, the, co the campaign shifted some to focus on keeping plastics out of food scraps and really making sure that we're separating our food scraps in a really clean way so that once they're composted, they're not ending up um, being a source of plastic pollution. Um, 
out in the soil or elsewhere. And this was the focus because there was a concern in the community about the amount of plastic that was ending up in food scraps in some places. And I think it's really common. Like we hear the same thing with recycling. Like it's good to, it's important to recycle. And then like, also it's really important to recycle well, to recycle properly. So in, for separating food scraps, it's really important to keep the plastic out of the food scraps. Take those plastic fruit stickers off. Let's see, another big focus on the behavior uh, in change piece was on coaching, mentoring, and just problem solving help. So we have a phone number and a campaign website that we just publicize really widely in all our resources and we tell people to call us. And our team itself has talked to hundreds of people to just help get them the info that they need about their local options as fast as possible to answer their questions, to help them sort of like break down any barriers to change, to connect them to inspiration. Those one-on-one -on -one or small group conversations really can make a difference for making something go from feeling hard to feeling easy. Um, and also I feel like they're really powerful for helping folks that are not like thrilled to be doing the behavior to sort of overcome that, like they can feel heard about why they're not feeling thrilled. And then they're like, okay, now that I feel heard, what, what do I need to do? And that's a really helpful part of behavior change. I think we all want to feel heard. Um, but we cannot talk to everyone alone. So a lot of other partners um, played a key part in this role and in other parts of rolling out this residential food scrap ban. So I'm just going to call out a few of these essential partners so one is Vermont solid waste management entities. In Vermont, every town has some solid waste materials management obligations, and a few towns manage those responsibilities independently, but most of them have grouped together to form these entities, many of which um, have paid staff that do are dedicated to doing this work. And they have played a really huge and essential role in the rollout of this law and others. They provide information in their communities and outreach they provide assistance. Some of them have been selling discounted backyard composting bins for years and years and years. Some of them have been teaching backyard composting workshops for free, free workshops for years and years. Some of them provide small grants in their communities and some of them operate facilities. They operate food scrap collection points. A couple of them even operate their own compost facilities. So they're doing all sorts of work to help make it possible for people to keep their food scraps out of the trash and to have them be managed well. Also, um, University of Vermont Extension has been teaching the Master Composter course for 19 years. This course is funded and supported by our department, and they've taught over a thousand Vermont students. And some of these students stay on in the program as Master Composter volunteers and really act as like compost heroes or compost ambassadors or whatever you want to call it in their community. And they make a really big difference. And just as a snapshot, I know this is a little while ago, but in 2021, there were 95 volunteers registered. And of those 95, 26 of them reported 400 hours of service and reaching over 2000 people. So this program also has helped make sure that there are people all over the state in so many different communities that are putting energy and time and quality information and effort into this initiative to just help make it happen. Some of them are supporting school compost sites or community gardens or teaching workshops in their communities or tabling at farmers markets or answering the master composter hotline that anyone can call with questions. So they've played a huge part. And also Vermont has a nonprofit called the Composting Association of Vermont that has played a really huge role in this um, mentoring and coaching part, and they do many other things. They run an annual um, organics recycling summit that's partly funded and supported by our department that create is a con uh, one day conference that now is a webinar series or a combo um, that, yeah, just creates a space for people to come together and share information and work through problems on this topic. And then they've been a, played a large part in supporting community composting, on-farm food scrap composting, organics diversion from mixed-use buildings, and much more. So I know that their phone was also ringing off the hook in uh, July of 2020, and um, they've, they've made a big difference. They've helped so many people and have helped people who are able to then help other people. So that's the behavior piece. Looking at increasing composting capacity, again, this is just a snapshot of work that's been done in the state, but our department 
does offer a compost operator training course that's focused on medium and large scale composting. The master composter course is focused on small scale composting like backyard or community garden scale. Um, and uh, there have been 10 courses since 2011 and a lot of folks have gone through this and who, including people who are running compost facilities today. We also offer free technical assistance to compost facilities. 45 facilities have been helped since 2012. This might be help with designing a new facility or with permitting or with problem solving or dealing with a nuisance or expanding or coming up with efficiencies or whatever else. So this has been a big help. Um, and we have been able to provide over a million and a half dollars worth of grants in three rounds to 18 projects. And um, yeah, running a compost facility is not a especially lucrative uh, pursuit here in Vermont. Um, although I guess, yeah, that's what I hear. I'm not running one. So, <laughs> so it's helpful to have great money available. Um, many of the facilities are run by um, municipalities, although many of them are also run by businesses. Anyway, these grants have just been for the municipal systems. Let's see. So our last piece of implementing any law, I think, also is responding to challenges. And I'll just highlight one challenge in Vermont that I know is true in some other parts of the country, which is that we have a really healthy black bear population. We're a um, fairly rural state and we have a lot of forests and there have been increasing numbers of human and black bear conflicts in recent years. So our team and you know our partners also have partnered with the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department to really spread a message about it being really important to um, be thoughtful about not feeding black bears. So that includes taking down bird feeders unless there's a foot of snow on the ground because bears love bird seed and can smell it from far away and um, making sure food scraps are not accidentally feeding bears. So for backyard composting, that means composting in an enclosed container that would be hard for bears to a bear to open and also using lots of dry brown plant materials to help the food scraps break down more quickly and also um, to contain smells. And then we also have a bunch of standard tips for if somebody gets a curious bear or lives somewhere where they know there's a lot of bears, what can they do to be too strategic to make sure they're not uh, enticing the bear or they're deterring the bear. Um, and we've recently learned that actually trash has been the biggest problem in the most recent year. So we're increasing our messaging around storing trash with bears in mind, <laughs> really storing trash carefully to make sure that bears can't get into it. So there's more work to be done on this theme for sure. Although we have seen some good results. We've seen um, places storing their food scraps in really sturdy uh, containers and buildings and also um, using electric fencing is a highly recommended strategy for anything that might attract a bear to um, bait the electric fence so that a bear gets a little zap to the nose and learns to avoid the fence. Um, and this picture on the bottom right was actually from our department's bear biologist. His system was to put the compost in, in with the bird, in with the uh, honeybees. Um, so they're both protected by the fence. So now we'll just wrap up by touching on a couple of our sort of signs of success and the data we do and don't have. So we do know that many hundreds of backyard compost bins have been sold in Vermont and are in use out on, on the land, across the land. Um, and they actually were sold out in parts of the state in 2020, which was partly supply chain issues in 2020, but also was a, a metric or a, in response to the demand. And then we know that thousands of folks in Vermont have taken the master composter course or have taken other local backyard composting workshops. There's over a hundred food scrap drop-offs across the state and there are three times as many food scrap haulers. So like food scrap pickup companies as there were in 2012 when the law was passed. And in 2020, we saw a real surge of new small food scrap calling companies that were responding to all these people who now wanted to hire a food scrap a company to pick up their food scraps. Um, and many of those companies are still in business today, more than three years later. Also, we're going to hear next from Emily about this recent UVM study, so I won't talk about it that much, but I'll just highlight two metrics from the study or two findings, I guess, that were exciting to me and my team, which is that they found that 85% of Vermonters are composting and 61% feel a moral obligation to keep food scraps out of the landfill. And this has only been a law for three years. And so these both feel 
like exciting and signs of success to me. Um, you know, we've been recycling for decades um, and our Vermont's, um, uh, well, I won't go down that train of thought. Anyway, I can talk more during the Q&A if you're interested about why these feel like metrics of success to me, but we'll hear from Emily first. Um, and then let's see, last but not least, we do have some data from our regulated compost facilities and our regulated drop-offs. So that's transfer stations mostly. And we have an, up, an estimate of backyard composting, how many food scraps are being managed that way. We update that estimate every five years with a study. And from that data, we've seen like a gradual increase in the amount of food scraps being managed, except for 2020, which was a drop and also a very unusual year. So we'll have to just see over time if 2020 is just an outlier or not. So we have seen this gradual increase mostly of the amount of food scraps being managed in these methods, but we don't have data from on-farm composting, from animal feeding, like if a bakery separates all their, um, their gone bad baked goods that don't have meat and feeds, gives those to a pig farmer. We don't have that data. We don't have data from other compost sites like schools, and we're missing some anaerobic digester data also. So we really don't have a full picture currently of what's happening to food scraps in Vermont and how many are being managed and how that has changed over time. So we are fortunately doing a big study this year right now as part of our um, 2023 waste composition study to gather some more of that data and to get a better sense of what is happening with food scraps in Vermont. And we are also, um, our contractors are also doing a general waste composition study. So we'll get to see what percent of the trash um, is food scraps and if that has changed over time. So stay tuned, more to come on that. And that wraps me up here. Thanks so much for your attention, everyone. Thank you, Emma. It's um, so interesting to see the differences in the programs between California and Ver Vermont and just how you both uh, take a different um, approach uh, to the food waste regulations. Um, and now we're going to hear from Emily. Um, see, I can see your presentation. And I'm going to use this opportunity before I start to just remind everyone that there is going to be the uh, the national alarm that goes off in about five minutes. So um, if it comes through your phone or computer, don't be startled. Um, Emily, could I ask you to speak a little louder? You're very yeah. loud. Are you able to hear me better now? Uh, just oh. a touch. Okay, let me let me try taking off my well, I'm in, I'm just gonna speak loud. <laughs> okay. Um perfect. So my name is Emily Bellarmino. I am absolutely delighted and humbled to be included as part of this presentation and uh, have an opportunity to share some of our evaluation findings exploring the impacts of the food waste ban in Vermont. Um today I'll because of the focus of this session, I'm gonna speak specifically about our work. Um with residents and trying to understand the impacts on residents. And one of the things that Marianne asked me to share was uh, a little bit about why someone who is faculty in a department of nutrition and food science might be looking at this question. And that's because um, my colleagues and I are really interested in uh, trying to envision more sustainable food systems and more sustainable uh, eating habits and, and eating patterns. And we know that uh, food waste has a very important impact on each of the pillars of sustainability. So a huge environmental burden, as we're all very much aware, um, as well as economic burdens, social burdens and bur burdens on health. So thinking about uh, into the future in five years, 10 years, 15 years, 50 years, what a more sustainable uh, food system and diet might look like, um, that is likely one that includes far less food waste, and that we find ways to reintegrate our food scraps back into uh, the food system. So uh, the research that we did um, with residents was based on the 2022 Vermonter poll. Uh, every year, the Center for Rural Studies at the University of Vermont conducts a statewide public opinion survey um, of adult Vermonters. And the survey sample is based on random sampling of uh, commercially available email lists of, of 
Vermont adults email addresses. Um, in 2022, the survey was fielded in March and April, and any member of the public, um, any researcher, any government body, anyone can pay to have questions added to this survey. And so we paid um, a little under $5,000 to have a number of questions added surrounding uh, food uh, waste and also some of the other food policies that we were really interested in, in evaluating. So uh, the questions specifically that we asked, we wanted to know how residents of Vermont were managing their food waste uh, prior to implementation of the ban and in the year and a half since the ban was implemented. We wanted to understand people's knowledge and perspectives on the ban. And then we also wanted to understand whether people were composting, if they were composting, um, what their experience of experiences were, um, and if there were any uh, sorts of information or resources that would make composting easier for them. So the survey was completed by 782 individuals, um, although I will say that uh, a larger number of people uh, answered a number of the questions, including uh, some of the questions that we are most interested in. So some of our um, analyses have a slightly larger sample than this. And based on the Vermont population, uh, this is a plus or minus 3.5% margin of error, which means that if we conducted the same study um, 100 times, 95 of those times, uh, the results that we found would be within uh, plus or minus 3.5% of the results that, that we found. So feel pretty good about the sample size. Uh, I do want to note that uh, the Vermonter poll in 2022 um, reflects the sample, the population of Vermont with respect to the gender distribution and respect to household size, but it over-represents um, older adults and also slightly over over-represents um, Vermont uh, residents with higher incomes and more education. So following implementation of the ban, uh, residents reported increasing the amount of uh, food waste that they were separating from their trash by 48%. Um, the numbers that are shown on this slide are means, but the actual, uh, if you look at the medians, the medians are a little higher. So I think that's worth uh, noting. And I'm happy to talk more about that if, if anyone has questions, but uh, we saw an increase from 48% to 71%. So 23 percentage points or 48%. Um, we wanted to know uh, whether people were confused about what was involved in the ban. And part of our uh, interest in this particular question was the thought that if people are confused, they might be less likely to comply. And we found that 28% uh, of our respondents uh, responded affirmatively to the question, I'm confused about the requirements of the food waste ban. So they either agreed or strongly agreed with that statement. So over a quarter of um, Vermonters, oh, there's that. <laughs> um, over a quarter of Vermonters um, have some level of confusion related to the ban. I'm going to wait just another few seconds to see if the form finishes. OK. Um, another question that we asked, and this was one uh, that Emma shared just a moment ago, uh, was about moral obligation. And we asked this question specifically because we know um, in the research on pro-environmental behaviors, any type of pro-environmental behaviors, there seems to be a very strong link between a person feeling morally obligated to engage uh, in a behavior um, and actually doing that behavior. So we asked people their level of agreement with this statement, I feel morally obligated to take steps to keep my food waste from going to landfill to protect the environment. And we found that 61% of Vermonters agreed or strongly agreed with this statement. They had that moral obligation. Um, while 27% disagreed or strongly disagreed. And then the other um, opinion piece that we asked people 
was whether they felt the environmental benefits of the ban were greater than the economic costs. And here we found that 44% of our sample agreed or strongly agreed with this statement. And so the discrepancy that you see here between the moral obligation piece and the um, feeling that the benefits of the ban outweigh the costs uh, might suggest that people feel like they should be keeping their food waste out of landfill, but um, don't necessarily think that the ban is the best way to do that. Um, I will note that there was quite a few people, 29% uh, of our sample that was unsure about this. So really didn't know um, either what the environmental benefits were or what the economic costs were. The research that uh, we did was building on work that my colleague Meredith Niles conducted uh, in 2018, looking specifically at composting behaviors among uh, Vermonters. She also used the uh, 2018 Vermonter poll survey to collect her results. So we have a, a similar sample that we're looking at. And she found that 72% of Vermont residents reported composting at least some of their food scraps. Uh, when we asked a very similar question in 2022, we found that this had increased by 11 percentage points. Um, so it appears that more, uh, more Vermonters are composting. Now, um, I'll just note that uh, after Emma presented her um, beautiful pictures of the bears in, in people's compost bins, um, this is not how we're recommending people compost in Vermont, but um, we have seen this increasing uh, in, in compost behavior. Building from that, we were really interested in understanding um, the range of methods that people are using to manage their food waste, how they're managing it um, uh, on a percentage scale. So the, the leading food waste um, disposal method is composting, either um, people are composting themselves or they're giving their food scraps to friends or neighbors to compost. Um, following this is dumping food scraps in the trash. And then we have a range of other strategies that people are using, either bringing them to food waste facilities, um, having them picked up by their trash service or food waste hauler, putting them into sink disposal, feeding them to pets or livestock. Um, some other people reported like throwing it in the woods. So um, there's a range of strategies that are using that people are using, but the top strategy is composting. And diving a little deeper into this, we found that um, one in five composters felt that composting is hard or very hard. And so these results are represented in this pie graph with the dark green is very hard and the lighter green um, is hard. Those that are shown in purple are individuals that felt that it was um, not it, it was not a challenge for them. Understanding that a large number of people, so you know, uh, one fifth of composters are, are struggling. Understanding their needs to make it easier are really important, and so we ask people, you know what would what would make it easier what would relieve some of that burden and the um list here shows the full range of recommended needs however the the three highest up on the list were information about how to compost food scraps correctly information about composting in the winter and information about getting rid of fruit, fruit flies so that gives us some um direction and in, in where public information might be useful. So um, to summarize some of the key points here, we found that since implementation of the ban, more food scraps are being separated from the trash. That's really exciting to see. Um, and the leading disposal method is through composting. Um, however, there's still over one fourth of Vermonters that are confused about the um, requirements of the ban and over a fifth of those who compost are um, uh, unsure about the best ways to compost and so there's definitely ideas um, embedded in that about what sorts of public information might help people 
uh, comply more with the law. So thanks so much. I just want to thank um, the team that I worked with on this and also our funder, the James M. Jeffers Fund at the University of Vermont. So I will stop there and stop sharing my slides. Thank you, Emily. Okay, we are going to um, begin looking at some of the questions that have come in. I know uh, Mallory had answered quite a few. So Mallory, let me know if you've already answered this one. Um, does CalRecycle see certain area regions within the state that are consistently not meeting the regulatory requirements? And if so, are there different targeting approaches used in that same jurisdiction um, but where there are both rural and urban environments and how much, you know. How yeah, great, great question. I did not address that one yet. So yes, we are seeing that there are certain regions throughout the state um, that are having difficulties with implementing their programs. Um, obviously, California is a really big state and we have jurisdictions of all, all kinds. We have deserts, mountain, beach, urban, rural, um, all different kinds. We even have some jurisdictions that are isolated on the other side of the mountains that take their material into Nevada. Um, so we do, we are seeing that there is difficulty um, implementing certain programs. Um, and we are also, um, to address the rest of the question, we do see jurisdictions, um, one city that has two different types of regions within their own city. So the great thing about the SB 1383 regulations is it does allow for flexibility in the way they implement their programs. So they can have two separate types of programs. Um, for example, we have a city that has a peninsula. And so for the main part of their city, they have one type of residential collection system. But for those out on the peninsula, they have an entirely different type of residential collection system um, to address the issues they have with space constraints and the fact that they have a lot of um, folks coming and going during the summer that Airbnb those type of um, condominiums. So they just have different contaminations issues they have to address. Um, did that answer the question? Yeah, and this question, I guess, goes to both Emma and you, Mallory. Is your program encouraging any bio bag use? So that's a great question. I was about to put that um, in the chat here, but um, our SB 1383 regulations do um, allow for compostable plastics within the organics container if the jurisdiction has a written letter from the facility saying that they allow compostable plastics. Um, we wanna make sure that the facilities are able to break down that material. And so this allows us to um, ensure that the facilities um, at the end of the program have some say in the type of material that they're receiving. Yeah, it depends where the food scraps are going. It's up to the composter. So. Um, that is something that is confusing. And I'll just explain for folks that that's something that's different in Vermont from a lot of other places is that um, very few municipalities in Vermont actually do the trash and recycling and maybe food scrap pickup. Um, most, in most cases, individual people are deciding what they want to do. Maybe they bring their materials to the drop off to a transfer station because that's cheaper. Or maybe they hire a company who comes and picks it up. So there might be multiple companies of trucks driving down the same street. And so for food scrap hauling, sometimes that's a company that's already picking up trash and recycling, but sometimes that's a totally separate business that's just picking up food scraps. So we have this real patchwork. And so whether there's bio bags or other, um, anything other than food scraps allowed is based on where the food scraps are going. And so, Often it's like the hauler or the, the transfer station, whoever is the intermediary that has to communicate that. And that is a place that there is confusion and just sort of like ongoing education around that. And we did have a big facility um, recently change what they were accepting um, because they were having so many issues with contamination. And so like in that part of the state, there's still like discussion and confusion and frustration 
um, and learning happening around that because people had to change what they had been doing to have a new system. And both- like for compostable dishes, for example, they're not accepting compostable dishes anymore. So in Vermont overall, a lot of the compost facilities and operations are only accepting food scraps. And there are some that accept um, some other materials, um, but definitely only certified bio bags if they are one of those ones, because there's a lot of greenwashing and confusion around <laughs> green bags in general. Um, and for both of you, can you talk about how many staff you have for for this program specifically? Sure. Um, so at Cal Recycle, we've always had our local assistance team of staff, and they're the ones that have worked with our jurisdictions through the years implementing all types of recycling programs. So when SB 1383 was passed, we went ahead and split that local assistance staff and move half of them into a jurisdiction compliance unit so that we could deal with the enforcement pieces of SB 1383. Um, the passage of SB 1383 also allowed us to receive additional funding so that we could create new positions at Cal Recycle to deal with this. So I would say at this point, um, when you're considering staff, supervisors, managers, and branch chiefs, we're probably at about um, 30 or 40 in the local assistance, and again, about another 30 or 40 in our jurisdiction's compliance unit specifically to deal with SB 1383. So sort of similar to what Mallory said at the beginning, our staff are not only focused on the residential food scrap ban. So our solid waste program has, I think, 16 folks. And I just did a quick count. And I think I would say maybe 12 of them have some like sizable part of their job that focused on this at a time. So we have folks who are doing um, grants and outreach and education. And we also have the compliance folks and the folks who are certifying facilities and also doing the technical assistance. So yeah, it's a little, a little hard to say, but that's how. Oh, that's true. Yeah. We also have facilities um, inspectors. We had to hire a new lawyer to deal with developing regulations. So we had to build out the team in a lot of different departments too. And can both of you talk a little bit about enforcement? How strong is the enforcement piece of your regulation? And um, I would say, what is the most uh, severe um, result that has occurred as from your enforcement? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, we started our enforcement um, on SB 1383 in 2022. Um, and right now we are trying to only um, find the egregious offenders. We're really taking this opportunity to work with the jurisdictions to assist them in building out their program. And that's the way we'd like to um, start out our enforcement. Um, the SB 1383 regulations does have a whole section in there about um, notice of violations and how much that jurisdictions can be fined. It really depends on the piece of SB 1383 in which they're um, not being compliant with, but jurisdictions do have the ability of being fined $10,000 per day. Wow. Sure. Yeah. So I, it's like a little tricky to think about which piece. So just for like food scraps being banned from the trash, the focus really so far has been on outreach and education and assistance and like, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's not on fines. And um, we do respond to complaints that we get or like tips. And we have gotten just a couple folks who are saying, oh, my neighbor's not doing this. Um, and then, you know, the outreach and education has been sufficient to resolve it. Um, there's a lot of other parts of the universal recycling law, like that the transfer stations need to be offering food scrap collection um, and that the towns have to have um, ordinances for pay as you throw ordinances for some of those larger scale pieces. 
um, sometimes we've had to go further through our outreach and then um, compliance process with those to get to compliance. So like I can know, for example, there like is a business, there was a restaurant who was not separating their food scraps from the trash. And we have this whole outreach process we go through and it wasn't working. And then um, they did get a notice of alleged violation. And I think that they did end up coming into voluntary compliance after that. So I don't think anybody has been fined yet at this point, but um, yeah. And there isn't a set, the law's not written away that there's a set fine that's calculated like case by case based on a couple different factors like what is the situation and what benefit are they getting yeah, and if it's okay i'll just go ahead and add um since emma was talking about the um, enforcement on the residents themselves um so like i said we have the enforcement in place for the jurisdictions but we also do have enforcement for the generators um, and that'll start in January 1 of 2024, and it'll be up to the jurisdictions to go ahead and do that enforcement. Um, and in their ordinances, they can go ahead and um, have fines and penalties included in there that they could um, deliver out to the generators. Um, but, you know, like we said, for the last couple of years, the jurisdictions really have been focusing on educating their generators so that they can get these programs in place. Um, and we also do have a, a complaint tip line at CalRecycle for folks to go ahead and report issues that they're seeing. Um, we mostly see that they're reporting on maybe multifamily complexes or businesses that don't have the program in place, less so about their um, neighbors not participating in the program. Yeah, and I maybe will add like what's more common rather than a neighbor not participating is people having questions about landlords like do I need to be hiring a pickup or should my landlord be hiring it? And we can help folks navigate that. And we have spoken to landlords to just help them. Yeah, work through, work through <laughs> that because it's there's flexibility, which means that it's like different in a lot of different situations. Emily, you talked before about so many people thinking composting was hard. Can you dive into that a little bit? or help us to understand what was hard for them? Yeah, that's a great question. And we um, we didn't ask people to tell us specifically what was hard, but I think we can learn some lessons from understanding where people said more information would be helpful. Um, and so some of the ideas that we might derive from that is uh, concerns over fruit flies. Um, Vermont is a very cold state. Um, so the challenges that uh, people face with winter composting are very real. And um, we, you know, that was an area where people were really keen for more information. Um, so, you know, we're fortunate because as Emma shared, there are a lot of resources in the state to support people with composting. Um, but we know that there you know, are a number of Vermonters that had never um, engaged in any composting behavior prior to 2020 and are trying it for the first time. Um, we also know that people might be trying to engage in more composting than they did in the past and trying to think about composting um, different types of food products that they weren't composting before and, and navigating the best way to do that. Yeah. I, and this question goes out to all three of you. Um, how, uh, do you best get over the yuck factor, you know, of people thinking that keeping your food scraps until maybe like a week before they go to a transfer station to drop them off, you know, just dealing with that whole thing, it's dirty or it's gross. How do you, what's the response or did you see that as being one of the um, reasons why people have a hard time with it? Sure. I think there's a lot of different <laughs> options to deal with it. So if you're the compost composter accepts um, compostable plastic liner bags or allows folks to use paper towels or brown paper bags that can help if folks are 
emptying their small bucket in a tote like outside their apartment complex or something just emptying it regularly and rinsing it can keep make it a cleaner thing we also help teach people how to have fruit 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 fly traps and to keep food scraps in the fridge or the freezer um and then i think one thing that is really helpful about a composting workshop or having that like one-on-one coaching, especially if it's from someone in your community is I think the most impactful thing is actually just being around somebody who's already doing it and who has a system set up well and seeing that it's not, doesn't have to be gross or like, what are their strategies for dealing with it being yucky? Like I went to a great workshop once where at the end of the workshop, the, um, the teacher, the educator had a five gallon bucket of week old food scraps. And she's like, you all had no idea that you were in this small room with this bucket of food scraps this whole time. Here's what I do, which this is another key tip is that she puts some sort of dry brown plant material. I think she had like wood shavings. We could do dried leaves or something also puts a little layer each time she dumps her food scraps into cap it and that that can really make a difference. And then I guess also for folks hiring pickup services, some companies clean their um, totes each time they pick up and some of them don't. And some of them provide this cover material um, and some of them don't. So we just try and um, coach people to understand just like how, what the options are and how that works. And then if they're getting quotes to ask if that, you know, if their quote for their service includes a clean container or if they're responsible for cleaning it. And if it includes cover material or if they're responsible for for having that if they want to use it. Um, yeah, yeah. I feel like the, the easiest thing is being around someone or somewhere that's doing it already and just getting used to it and like feeling like that's more normal. And then once you stop doing it, it like, it's hard for, hard for people to stop sometimes once they get used to it. But I think, yeah, like Emily was saying, winter and, you know, summer fruit flies, like some of those specific things can really be helped with specific tips and so yeah the coaching and more information helps I'll also add that I um I don't know what work has been done around this and it's possible that someone in this call has done really interesting research in this area but I would say the starting point is asking people like is this icky to you and if yes what part of it because I think with that information you can really come up with targeted strategies and I can imagine those are very different for different types of residents. So someone who lives in a rural area and is doing backyard composting might have um, different ick points than someone who is um, putting their food scraps curbside. Similarly, uh, someone in an apartment complex might have a different ick factor than someone who's um, uh, doing it in, in you know, a single family residence. So there's, um, I think, different touch points for different people and trying to understand where someone is at, it's likely gonna be the best um, way to move forward. And you know, as Emma mentioned, this whole thing of, for instance, some food scrap haulers um, cleaning out bins and um, providing bags and others not, um, I can imagine that sort of thing might make a big difference for, um, willingness to participate and comply. Thanks, Emily. Um, so to kind of build off of what Emily was just saying there, um, in California at Cowher Cycle, we like to use community-based social marketing um, when we're creating our marketing strategies. Um, so that's kind of a a list of ideals that you can kind of follow to make sure that your your marketing strategy is resulting in the behavior change that you want to see. So one of the first steps is identifying the barriers that people have um, with the action that you want to see. So um, if you look at our Recycle Smart, our I Recycle Smart campaign. Um, you can see that we did see that was a barrier and created targeted education outreach material for that. Um, and of course, the part of community-based social marketing that's really important is that you create a pilot program to test out your education outreach to make sure that it's effective. And if it's not, then you tweak it until it is, and then you roll it out to the community as a whole. 
Um, and like Emily was saying, it's really targeted to that community in particular. So different people are going to experience um, the behavior change you want and have different barriers in different ways. So it's really important to go through the process to identify those barriers and have targeted solutions. Um, and you can go to cbsm.com if you have more um, questions about community-based uh, social marketing. Thanks, Mallory. So someone has a question here about how did you get buy-in from your legislators for your regulation? And a second part to this question is, what are your biggest barriers and how are you addressing them? Unfortunately, I don't feel like I can speak to that. Maybe there's someone else here from Vermont who can speak to that because I was not in this uh, in this role at that time. So I'll pass over and I can talk barriers after, but I'll let Mallory sure. talk about legislators first. Let sure. me um, just ask the group first. Is there anyone from Vermont that can speak to the question of how to, how legislators got on board with the Vermont regulation? If so, wave your hand so we can see you. Okay, I guess not. I, I um I was not in Vermont when this passed, but I do think for those who live outside of Vermont, a key point to keep in mind is that we only have one municipal landfill in the state and it's rapidly filling up. Um, and so I think that definitely uh, weighed heavily on the Vermont state government when they were making decisions about this back in 2012. Um, they've just expanded the landfill in the last few years and they still feel like there's only 20 to 25 years left um, in, in that landfill. So um, I think that's a really important piece for our state that's, you know, has a small population, but still um, has this uh, su substantial challenge. Mallory, did you want to add to that? Um, sure, I can add a little bit. Um, so the way that it works in the state of California is CalRecycle ends up being the one that once laws pass, we create the regulations um, and off, often do the enforcement when it comes to waste and recycling laws. Um, but we aren't involved in the process of creating those laws or getting um, the legislators on board. Um, we do have different groups throughout the state of California that do um, work with our legislators to try to push forward certain pieces of legislation. Um, I know we have Nick from Californians Against Waste on the line right now, if he wants to chime in and, and talk about that. There's a 50-50 chance you would punt that question to me. Um, <laughs> it, it's it's complicated and it's a very long answer and I think the, the quick version is that it was just a confluence of a bunch of different policy drivers with kind of the waste reduction goals we have combined with the climate targets um, we had overall climate targets but on top of that we passed legislation around short-lived climate pollutants so specifically targeting the greenhouse gases that have the biggest impact most quickly um, and then on top of that, we also have a healthy soils program that encourages uh, soil practices like compost use, but also conservation tillage and other healthy soil practices. And it was just sort of the confluence of all of those together that got the legislature on board. Um, we also have amazing case studies with local programs that have implemented this that we can point to um, in the Bay Area, LA, all over. Thank you, Nick. So the second part of the question was about barriers or the main challenges with um, implementing your programs. Sure, I can say one idea about the biggest challenge ties right back to what Emily shared of just trying to make it as easy as possible for as many people as possible is a challenge. So there has been work and effort to try and have as many drop-offs as possible so that more people have a convenient drop-off. As I mentioned, some of them are free or low cost and some of them are expensive. And that is just up to the 
company what they are going to charge for their program. Um, yeah, having more pickup options has is always <laughs> really great, but there's parts of the state where you have more choice or less choice there also. So yeah, like Emily was saying, maybe you can't, you might be somewhere where you don't have, have a choice of exactly what service you want. Um, and then yeah, backyard composting is not a good fit for everyone. So, um, you know, we already talked about making sure that backyard or side yard <laughs> or community garden composting is happening with animals in mind um, and is being managed really um, well, but also like that's just not going to be a good option for for many people for many reasons. So having them have other options is important too. So, and then there's the getting the information out and make, you know, having them be connected to somebody who knows and can answer their question and can teach them how easy it is to make a fruit fly trap or to get the tip to store their food scraps in the freezer if they have freezer space before they bring them to the drop off. Those little things can make a big difference, but you really need a community like wide amount of knowledge to get everyone the answers that they need. Mm -hmm. Mallory, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I'll say in the state of California, one of our biggest barriers we're experiencing right now is trying to increase the amount of capacity that we can put through our facilities. Um, so we need many more facilities to come on board in order to process the amount of organics that we're talking about. Um, so Cal Recycle is helping by providing funding and grants um, and loan programs in order to get um, private businesses and entities to step up to start to build these facilities. But of course, building facilities takes many years. Um, the permitting process in California can be quite extensive. Um, so that's one of the biggest barriers we're um, experiencing over the next couple of years. Um, I'll say the other thing too is just, I mean, this is a huge culture shift for everyone in California to be able to um, go from trash and recycling to now needing to participate in an organics collection system. Um, but the great thing with SB 1383 is it rolled out across the entire state to everyone everywhere. So you're not just doing this at your home, but you're also doing it at your business or your school, or um, if you're out walking around at a baseball game or anywhere you go, there's this new organics program in place. And with the standardized colors, it makes it easy across the state to understand um, where you should be putting materials. Have either states had uh, any instance where there were large food producers, whether a grocery store or manufacturer, where the food was maybe past its due date, but it was packaged? So how has that been dealt with? That's a great question. I mean, I think for us, it really depends on the um, collection program that they have in that local area. So um, a business that has that type of issue would have to work with their hauler to see what kind of program they have in place. We do have some trash haulers in the state of California that have the ability to depackage the food while it's going through their system so that the businesses don't have to do that themselves. But um, they have certain machinery that's able to do that before it goes down um, for processing. So, but like I said, it really depends on the trash hauler that they're using and the type of facilities that they have access to. Yeah, and I can say there are some haulers in Vermont also that will collect packaged food and there is um, one depackaging machine in Vermont that can separate organics from their packaging. And then also, um, I think at least one hauler brings material out of state to a depackager in a different neighboring or nearby state. So I'd like to pose this next question. This will be our last question for the day. If there's something you could change or add to the existing regulation to make it better, 
what would it be? And I'm going to start with you, Emily. <laughs> I saw you take a deep breath. <laughs> oh, no. Um, oh, my goodness. Um, you know, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I feel like there is really exciting changes happening um and you know the the department's working really really hard to ensure smooth implementation and we're still in the early phases so i um i suspect i would be better able to answer this question in five or ten years okay um, but i'm gonna bump it to emma i'm interested what emma has to say <laughs> sorry emma Blame Mary. One thing to change in the regulation. Gosh, I just do not even have an answer. Mallory, you can go. <laughs> Sorry. I, yeah, I feel like we're three for three. Um, I agree in a few years, we'll have better feedback on changes we want to make. Um, but a lot of times for us in California, that really ends up um, being directed by the, the legislature. Well, I want to thank you all for participating and um, sharing your experience and your all of your experience with us. Um, this has been a really interesting conversation about dealing with something that's so common for everyone in food waste. You know, what do you do with it? How do you deal with it? And just sharing your approaches to in your states and in your research, Emily. Um, thank you all very much. And I'd just like to thank everyone who attended today and for asking such thoughtful questions. And I wish you all a great afternoon and we'll have the recordings and the presentations up on NERC's website uh, tomorrow. And the link for that has been put in the chat for all of you. And uh, and hopefully in three to five years, we'll have a follow-up conversation. Thank you all. Have a great day.